Hey everyone, it's Rena Jadif here from Health Boot Camps and the Live Longer Podcast. And today it is my true honor to have with us a brilliant physician, best-selling author, creator of the famous scientifically backed program to reverse heart disease through diet and lifestyle, Dr. Dean Ornish. Dr. Dean, welcome. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. So I have to definitely share a little bit more about you. Now, Dr. Dean Ornish is also the president of the nonprofit Preventative Medicine Research Institute in Sausalito. But you know what he's most famous for? Is being the personal physician consultant to former President Bill Clinton. Who exactly. All right, let's dive into chapter one. So chapter one, you literally start off by saying, it works. What's the essence of that chapter? Well, as I mentioned, we've been doing for 40 years that the more you change, the more you improve. And the more diseases we study and the more mechanisms we look at, the more reasons we have to explain why that's the case. So what I did, and I've also learned that even more than being healthy and being wanting to feel free, is that there's a whole language of behavioral change has this kind of fascist, uh, moralistic, uh, humiliating quality to it. You know, the whole idea of patient compliance, like getting yes. one to bend their will to another. Or, you know, if you go on a diet, chances are you're going to go off a diet. And then you have all that shame and guilt and anger and humiliation, which are really much more toxic than, than, than the food itself. And so what I realized is that, you know, instead of making this a diet, it's just a way of eating and living. So, you no, know, food is just food, but some foods are healthier for you than others. So I categorized foods from the most healthy, what I call group one, which are basically the whole foods, plant-based food to group five, the most unhealthy, which are the foods that are high in animal protein and sugar and things like that, and groups two through four and immediate. And so it's a personalized diet, not based on what I'm telling you to do, but rather you decide how much you want to change, how quickly, how many things. We support it, we track it. If that degree of change is enough to accomplish your goals, great. If not, do more. It's radically simple. So you can't fail because if you indulge yourself one day, it doesn't mean you cheated or you failed or you're bad or all those pejorative words. It's eat healthier the next. If you don't have to exercise one day, do a little more the next. Do what you like, and you know it's going to be much more successful that way. I love it. All right, chapter two. Why does it work? It works because um, these different chronic diseases share very similar chronic underlying mechanisms, and they're all influenced by the diet and lifestyle choices that we make each day, and to the degree that you make them. And so, the more you change, the more you improve, and uh, and and then it comes out of your own experience, so that you don't have to wonder if it's true, you can actually see that. So let's say you wanted to lose 10 pounds or get your blood pressure down 10 points or get your uh, cholesterol level down 50 points or whatever it happens to be. So you can say, what, and so I'd say, what are you eating now? Well, I'm eating mostly unhealthy stuff. Okay, instead of saying, well, here's your diet, and then they have that pushback because you now I'm feeling controlled. Yeah. It's just, say, okay, how much are you willing to change? It's like, oh, no one's ever asked me that before. Oh, I don't know, I'll eat less uh, sugar, eat less red meat and more, um, fruits and vegetables. Great. How much uh, exercise are you doing now? Mm, not that much. How much are you willing to do? Oh, I don't know. I'll walk 20 minutes a day. Great. How much uh, meditation and yoga are you doing? Uh, zero. How much are you willing to do? Oh, I'll, I'll meditate 10 minutes a day. Great. How much love and support do you have in your life? Well, not enough. Okay. Well, what are you willing to do? Well, I'll spend more time with my friends and family. Great. So we track it and we see how you do it. So after a month or so, let's say you wanted to lose 10 pounds and you lost six. We want to get your LDL cholesterol down 50 points, it came down 30. You say, great, look how much you've improved. You're on the right track. Now, if you do even more, you're going to get the rest of the way. Now, that's different from someone who's got a life-threatening condition and needs to reverse it. Then you really do have to be uh, pretty strict about it. But even then, by imbuing those choices with meaning, we're finding, paradoxically, we're actually getting bigger changes to intensive lifestyle changes than the, 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 the modest ones, which sounds counterintuitive because most people think, oh, I can get my patients to take their their statins, their cholesterol lowering drugs, there's no way they're gonna change their lifestyle, it's too hard. But most people are not taking their statins. You know, uh, 30 to 40% of people are taking them after six months to a year. 25% of people never even fill the prescription for them. And statins are of proven value, and if you have heart disease, so why aren't people taking them? And the reason is that they're fear-based. Yeah. Take this pill, the doctor says, it's not gonna make you feel better, hopefully it won't make you feel worse, to prevent something really awful from happening years down the road that you don't wanna think about, so you don't think about it. But when you make your lifestyle changes, if you really make big changes, because these underlying biological mechanisms are so dynamic, most people find that they feel so much better so quickly, it reframes the reason for making these changes from fear of dying, which is not sustainable, to joy and pleasure and love and feeling good, which are. Well, I have an insight on why people don't fill prescriptions, because I never filled my 
my prednisone prescription. And it's because if I filled it, it meant I had given up, that I was choosing this Band-Aid. And as I had been told, I may be on it for life. Yes. I, I looked at that prescription a whole bunch of times because I was told, you know what? just a couple of these and boy, every symptom will be gone. And yeah, of course there is, you know, here's this long laundry list of symptom of um, side effects. Yes. Well, that, I, just, I could never fill it. And I think that's why a lot of people don't fill the statins because it's- Well, you're right. And, and the same thing is, you know, why people, you know, if you have to take a medication two or three or four times a day for the rest of your life, every time you take it, it reminds you that you're sick. Exactly. And the doctor well, says, you know, you're gonna take this forever. Now, what we've learned is that if you turn off the faucet, if you treat the cause, that the need for drugs and surgery is often greatly reduced and often eliminated. So under your doctor's prescription, under your doctor's supervision, let's say you have high cholesterol, say, okay, let me try changing my lifestyle and make big changes. We found, for example, a 40% average reduction in LDL cholesterol, comparable to what you get with drugs, but the only side effects here are good ones, you know? And so ask your doctor, can you start to wean me off these medications? And then as you start to be able to do that, you, you not only do you get the benefit of not the side effects and the cost, but it reminds you for the reasons you're talking about, hey, I'm really getting better. I don't need as many of these pills. And that's a really powerful virtuous cycle that people get into. Right, chapter three, how it works. It works because uh, these underlying mechanisms that we've talked about are all influenced by diet and lifestyle choices to the degree that you make them. And so as you begin to change your lifestyle, you start to feel better. And every metric that we look at objectively gets better as well. And then you get into this mindset of saying, oh, I really can do something about this. And I start to feel better. I mean, let's take someone who's got um, uh, 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 chest pain due to heart disease, angina. And as they start to make these changes, their angina starts to go away. And like, oh, wow, I can walk across the street without getting pain. I can make love with my spouse. I can play with my kids. I can go back to work. And then it's like, okay, well, that, I, I like eating cheeseburgers, but not that much, you know, because what I gain is so much more than what I give up. Because these mechanisms are so dynamic, it's not about preventing something bad from happening, you know, years down the road. It's not about living to be 86 instead of 85. That doesn't really motivate most people. It's about, I can feel much better very quickly within days and certainly within weeks because I'm making these changes. What I gain is so much more than what I give up. And that's what makes it sustainable. I love that. All right, next chapter, chapter four, you are unique. So what's the essence of that? Well, you know, it's unique in the sense that, um, you know, some people are willing to make different degrees of lifestyle change. But one of the things that we've actually learned is that with all this interest in personalized medicine and so on, that it wasn't like we found there was one diet and lifestyle program for reversing heart disease, another one for reversing prostate cancer or for getting your cholesterol, your blood pressure, your blood sugar, your genes, your telomeres, your angiogenesis. It was the same for all of them. And the more people followed it, the more they improved at any age. So there are individual differences. You know, some people, for example, can metabolize dietary sugar is better than others. Mm -hmm. But as it turns out that if you're not eating that much sugar anyway, then those differences don't matter so much. And so even though, you know, we like to think that uh, our individual differences are really so much different than everyone else's, we found that these same lifestyle changes can actually benefit almost everyone. And to the degree that you make them, there's a corresponding benefit. Now, what's personalized in the spectrum is that you decide how much you want to change. So, you know, you say, okay, I'm willing to make this degree of change, but not that. And to whatever degree you make a change, there's going to be a corresponding benefit, which hopefully will then motivate you to make even bigger changes, which is different than if you're actually trying to reverse a life-threatening condition. But even there, we found it was the same program that could reverse all these different conditions. And you find this in other countries. Let's look in Asia. 50 years ago, heart disease was, and, and, and most forms of cancer, chronic, you know, colon cancer, which you dealt with, prostate, breast cancer, were, were as rare there as malaria is here. Yes. And over the past 50 years, have they started to eat like us and live like us and now die like us. Yes. But their, their genetics, are they have a very wide diversity of genetics, just like we do in this country. And yet those diseases were very low because everybody pretty much was eating diets that were low in fat, low in sugar, low in animal protein, as well as they had a lot of social support. They were exercising and they had some kind of spiritual basis in their lives. And so, you know, from uh, Dan Buettner's Blue Zones work, we find those kind of commonalities you find everywhere. So even though our gene, their genes were different, they didn't get expressed until they started to eat more of a Western diet lifestyle. Absolutely. And so to the degree that people are willing to move in this direction, uh, we find there's a corresponding benefit. And so I put red meat in group five, chicken in group four, 
fish in group three, you know, plant-based foods that are higher in fat in group two and lower in fat in group one. So all of these things, it's not, you know, there's this big debate is it's not, you know, low fat is dead, it's all sugar. You know, Americans have totally less fat, we're fatter than ever, you know, it's not, yep. you know, it's all sugar. Well, it turns out we may have been told those things, but I went to the U.S. Department of Agriculture database, which actually tracks the entire U.S. food supply. And every decade since 1950, we've been eating more fat, more sugar, more meat, and more calories. So not surprisingly, we're fatter, not because we're eating too little fat, but because we're eating too much of everything. It turns out it's not this or that. It's, it's an, an optimal diet is low in fat and low in refined carbs and low in, in animal protein. It's mostly fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, soy products, as they come in nature. Um, and the same is true for these, um, for these other things. We don't, it's, you know, I debated Dr. Atkins a number of times before he died of heart disease. Yes. Um, and, and so what's important is not just weight loss or one thing, but what, what's happening to your arteries? What's happening to your health? And when you go on a, you know, the Atkins, or I really thought that would be over after he died, but, you know, then became as the paleo and ketogenic diet and all these things. And they just, you know, it's just never underestimate the power of telling people what they want to hear. You know, they tell people that bacon and sausage are health foods, and, and they're not, you know. And there was an article in the New England Journal of Medicine a few years ago by Stephen Smith, and he said, what actually happens in your arteries on different diets? And on a whole foods plant-based diet, they're essentially clean. On a standard American diet, they're partially clogged. On an Atkins, ketogenic, paleo, whatever the latest iteration of that is, they're severely clogged, even if they lose weight, even if their cholesterol and blood pressure aren't that different. And so it's important that when people are assessing how they want to eat and live, that they not only look at these so-called risk factors like cholesterol and blood pressure and weight, what, what's actually happening to your health itself? And that's why in our studies, we're not just looking at risk factors, we're looking at the actual underlying disease process. And we're finding that the arteries get, the blood flow improves after a month, after a, one year the arteries are less clogged, after five years or even more improvement, even less blockages. The same is true for their prostate cancer, their diabetes, these other conditions. The more you change, the more you improve at any age. And I think it's back to, you know, our culture kills. We've created this industry, this machine that turns out fads and diets with different names, different titles, then yeah. invests millions of dollars, finds doctors to propose, to support, to, you know, give the media the attention that these diets need in order to sell more of these diets. And so we're living in this sort of perpetual cycle of diet failure, diet failure, and again, yeah. sickness and obesity. And I feel like until each of us starts to pull back from it and no longer react to the new cool fad diet that's helping so-and-so lose 20 pounds in two days or you know, the usual crazy advertisements that we see, we're just gonna continue in this, this spiral, this downward spiral. And so I think the point you're making is we have to stop being a culture of extremes and a culture of fads and come down to just being in balance. Because I think if we just lived a normal life the way our ancestors lived, heck, when I say ancestor, I mean my grandparents. Yeah. You just kind of. You know, I mean, extremism is in the eye of the beholder, of course. I mean, some people would say that eating a whole foods plant based diet is extreme. I don't. That's the way that most of our, the world ate until they started to get enough. The word is overindulgence. Yeah, I mean, it's follow the money. I mean, it's. You know, media, if you're a magazine right now, look what happened to Time Magazine. It used to be the number one magazine in the world, and now it just it's almost on the trash bin. Yeah. Uh, and look at because uh, of these disruptions in, the, in those areas. And but medical journals are no different. They have something called the impact factor. And the more an article is picked up and in, in, yes. in, in the general media, the more impact it has. So like the New England Journal of Medicine and JAMA are among the highest impact factors in Lancet because they they publish articles that the, the headlines pick up. But unfortunately. Sometimes they publish studies that are really badly done just because they're provocative, like saturated fat isn't bad for you, or meat is good for you, or those kinds of things. And uh, if you actually, I mean, there was one study that came out in the British Medical Journal that said that, uh, or let's take even the, well, let's take this study. They said saturated fat, uh, not bad for you, okay? And they actually looked at the data two ways. One way was a so-called adjusted data, where they actually kind of manipulated the data they, you know, if you're eating a lot of cholesterol, they adjusted the saturated fat, but since they go together, kind of cancel each other out. But with the unadjusted data, the raw data, which is to me the most accurate because you have a finagle with it, they actually did find that saturated fat was associated with heart disease, diabetes, prostate, breast, colon cancer, et cetera, all the way down the line. And that didn't even make it into the abstract. So because they knew that if they had something provocative, it would be picked up worldwide, which it was, even though it ends up harming people with information that can really uh, damage 
Yeah, and there was a, a pretty famous study that just got redacted after decades of, of being in that study, right. The, uh, the Mediterranean diet. Well, exactly. that's a perfect example. Okay, in fact, I wrote a letter to the editor of the New England Journal which they published, and I just sent him another one yesterday about this new version of it. And the Prediment study said, the, the, the conclusion was, people eating a Mediterranean diet had lower heart attacks, death from all causes, and strokes than those eating a, quote, low-fat diet. Well, you know, it just made me want to pull out what's left of my hair because the low-fat diet group was, eating, they went from 39% fat to 37% fat, hardly any change at all, I mean, within the range of rounding error. The, um, it turns out that there was no difference in heart attacks, no difference in premature death from uh, heart disease, no difference in premature death from all causes. The only difference was there was a significant reduction in strokes because on the Mediterranean diet, you have more of the omega-3 fatty acids, which we've been adding in the form of fish oil or flaxseed oil for, for decades. And that helps to keep the blood from clotting. And since 90% of strokes are caused by blood clots, so called thrombus formation, they did show a reduction in, in uh, strokes, mm -hmm. but they pooled the data. There was, so when they averaged the data of the stroke and the heart disease and these other things, there was a net decrease. But it was all driven by the reduction in stroke. And yet the headlines and even the abstract itself made it seem like the Mediterranean diet had lower rates of heart attacks, when in fact, they had no difference at all. Right. And that was only compared to people who didn't really make much change, much as, as opposed to people who make big changes, which we found we could actually reverse it in, in the vast majority of people. Absolutely. All right, chapter five, the nutrition spectrum. What is the nutrition spectrum? Well, that's what we've been talking about, that um, I categorize uh, foods from the most healthy group one to the least healthy group five. What matters most is your overall way of eating and living. You decide how much you want to change and what your goals are. And if start by making moderate changes. If that's enough, great. If not, do more. But again, it's worth mentioning again that sometimes actually making big changes all at once is actually easier than making moderate changes because Absolutely. you feel so much better so quickly and you see so many great results on your cholesterol or blood pressure or blood sugar. That makes it say, oh, okay, this is you know a big change, but boy, it's really worth it. Again, not out of fear, but out of joy and pleasure and feeling good. And that's actually why the health boot camps, which is our 14 day online virtual program in partnership with doctors like yourself, it works. People have across the board incredible results because it's yep. a boot camp approach. And you, and you probably see them in the first few days, right? Exactly, exactly. That's People feel amazing and then they stick to it. And then at the end of the 14 days they go, now what, I feel great, I wanna continue with this. And we say, great, you have access, keep going. You know, don't mm -hmm. stop now. But it's that's why they work. Okay. Well, that's why, I mean, I have a nonprofit institute, a 501c3, called the Preventive Medicine Research Institute, which I, I founded back in 1984 after finishing my uh, medical training in Boston, moved to San Francisco. And through that, we trained 53 hospitals and clinics around the country, at, at Harvard, at Beth Israel, New York, at UCSF, at Scripps, at, at, at community hospitals, and all, all over the place. And we got, again, bigger changes in lifestyle, better clinical outcomes, bigger cost savings, better adherence. But some of the sites closed down, and I and they said, this is the best program we've ever had like this, but we have to close it down because you don't have insurance and Medicare reimbursement. And so that was the painful message, is how so much of healthcare, which is really often disease care, is because of, you know, all about the Benjamins, as the rappers would say, or follow the money. Mm -hmm. So that sent me on a 16-year journey with Medicare because I realized I could do a thousand studies with a million people and it would always remain a footnote unless we change reimbursement. So I had no idea how it was going to take six <laughs> years to do that, but we did. I mean, at one point, we even had to get a, a whole committee from the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute to, to prove that it was, it was not a, a dangerous behavior for people to walk, eat vegetables, meditate, and quit smoking compared to having their chest cut open or stents put in their arms. And, and you weren't harming them by asking them to eat well and, and walk a little. But, but parenthetically, there have now been eight randomized trials in stents and angioplasties and found they don't work. They don't prevent heart attacks. They don't prevent prolonged life. And we spend tens of billions of dollars every year on these procedures that are dangerous, invasive, expensive, and largely ineffective. And if you're in the middle of having a heart attack, they could be life-saving. But the vast majority of people are not, and they don't work. So anyway, I'm very grateful to, to Medicare because they created a new benefit category to cover our program. And so we've been training. I've been working with a company called ShareCare to train hospitals and clinics and physician groups around the country. And it's working. Again, we're getting bigger changes in lifestyle, better clinical outcomes, bigger cost savings, better adherence. But because it's reimbursed at a, at a fairly high level, it enables doctors to make a living doing this. And they're not really spending most of their time doing it. It's done, it's the doctor is the quarterback, but he or she is working with a, 
a meditation teacher, an exercise physiologist, a registered dietitian, a nurse, and they work together as a team. And the doctor oversees that, but he or she isn't spending much of their time doing it. The Medicare is going to pay for 70, they are paying for 72 hours of training. Not just a 10 minute visit where you don't really have time to talk about much. Right. But so people come twice a week for nine weeks. So they get for four hours at a time. It's a lot. An hour of exercise, an hour of stress management, an hour of a support group, and an hour of a group meal with a lecture. And after they finish their, their, uh, their nine weeks, their, their 72 hours, they continue to meet just like we're doing today with Zoom, a video conferencing. So the one hour they can say, okay, every Thursday from five to six, we're all going to have our support group, which is really what enables to get such high levels of adherence. So, you know, as you've experienced, when people go through a boot camp, they have these incredible experiences and tra transformations. And now by meeting once a week uh, virtually, we can sustain that so that, you know, 85, we're finding that 94% of these 72 hours are completed, which is ridiculous. And a year, even though it's only nine weeks long, a year later, 85 to 90% of the people are still following the program in every site that we've trained around the country. That's remarkable. Remarkable. Congratulations to you for sticking through the 16 years because it's a long haul. All right, next chapter, chapter six, the stress management spectrum. What is the stress management spectrum? It's the same idea. The more you meditate, the more you do yoga, the more you improve. So you decide how much to do it. Uh, and, you know, it, it, it improves you in a number of ways. One is you manage stress better. Your fuse gets longer. Things don't bother you as much. So people say things like, you know, they didn't change, but I did, you know, that yeah. you can do the same job, the same family, the same work environment, the same home, yeah. and yet you react to it in different ways. Just like when you're tired and run down, your fuse is shorter, and little day-to-day -day aggravations can often be the most stressful, things just don't bother you as much. It's not like you have to hold it in or explode. It's like, yeah, you know, I got, and then you can actually function at a much higher level to deal with whatever, whatever needs to be done. But also, as we talked about earlier, it quiets down your mind and body, so you experience more of an inner sense of peace and well-being, which you can then you know, remain very grounded and even when you're very busy out there. And if you take it even further, it gives you that direct experience of interconnectedness, that on one level we're separate, on another level we're already interconnected. And there was a wonderful study that was done by Nicholas Christakis at Harvard, where he found that if your friends are obese, you're 45% more likely to be obese yourself. If it's your friend's friends, it's 25%. If it's your friend's friend's friends, you're 10% more likely, even if you've never met them. That's how interconnected we already are. And it's not just obesity, it's, pretty, it's depression, it's pretty much everything. Yes, sir. Yes. So the support groups that we have, which we'll talk about in a moment, um, are designed to recreate that sense of, of intimacy, that intimacy is really healing. Even the word healing comes from the root to make whole. You know, yoga comes from the Sanskrit to yoke, to unite, union. These are really old ideas that we're rediscovering. And, you know, 50 years ago, I mean, there's been a radical shift in our culture in the last 50 years ago. 50 years ago, People had an extended family they saw regularly. They had a job that felt secure. They had a, uh, you know, a, a, a church or synagogue they went to regularly. They had a, uh, an extended family that they saw regularly. And today, many people don't have any of those things. Okay. And the thing that happens when you have an extended family that you, or a neighborhood with two or three generations of people that you grow up with is that they know you. They don't just know your Facebook profile. Uh, you know, exactly. In fact, there was a study that came out last month that showed that the more time you spend on Facebook, the more uh, depressed and, 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 and sick you get. And the reason is, is because it looks like everybody has this great life but you. You know, it's like, because people don't post like, oh, I was suicidal when I was 19, or oh, my son's on heroin, or, you know, I these dark stuff, or, I, or gosh, I have all these self-doubts. It's like, here I am at the front of the Eiffel Tower, you know, here I am with my perfect life and my perfect family, and they go like, what, what's wrong with me? And so it's like uh, James Cameron, the you know, legendary director in Avatar. It's like, I see you, you know, it's not, which is really an African Zulu proverb. It's like, what it means is not, I just, I don't just see your Facebook profile or your bio sketch. I see you, I saw you grow up. I saw you messed up. I saw when you were doubtful. I saw when you broke that window. I saw when you, you know, yes. you know were, were uh, so distraught over everything. And I'm still here for you. Yes. So our support groups are designed and really do replicate that. We create a safe environment where people can, let down their emotional defenses and just be open and authentic with each other yeah. and to focus on their feelings and communicating their feelings because it's really our feelings that connect us. And it's so easy to make, oh, that sounds so touchy-feely. And I used to get defensive and say, oh, no, no, look at our PET skins and our angiograms. Mm -hmm. One day I said, you know what? It is touchy-feely. That's what makes it work so well. We are touchy-feely creatures. We're creatures yeah. of community. And bringing people together in a safe environment where they can let down their defenses. Yeah. Like, again, it's not that you shouldn't have defenses. 
But if you have nowhere that feels safe enough to be open and authentic and no one that you trust enough to do that with, then those, in a sense, those walls are always up. And if they are always up, they isolate you. And if they isolate you, you're more likely, ironically, to get sick and die prematurely. Absolutely. And so, so many people in our culture have no one to do that with. And so when they can go into a support group, it's incredibly transformative. And then they can see how good that feels and then take that back into their other relationships and make them more intimate. And, and to that extent, they become that much more healed. And it's all about finding your tribe. I mean, that's a big part of what we do at Health Boot Camps is we help you connect with a tribe so you can grow together, bond together. And we actually do daily life calls that are free. So once you join the tribe every day, you can just jump on a free call and catch up with others, ask your questions. Because to your point, there is nothing available today that gives people that level of support and care. So there is now through what you're doing and through what we're doing with our with our programs that we're training around the country. Exactly. Right? Really exactly. And so often people say things like, "Oh, having a heart attack was the best thing that ever happened to me." I remember the first time I heard that, I was like, "What are you crazy?" And they say, "No, that's what it took to get my attention." And so often when people are sick, we're just trained to literally or figuratively bypass the problem or numb it or kill it, as opposed to saying, "Okay, there's an opening here." Because change is hard, but if you're in enough pain, suddenly the idea of change becomes more appealing. And then as you make these changes, the pain gets better, not just the physical pain, but the deeper depression and loneliness and isolation. Absolutely. That becomes the doorway that we're trying to change medical education so that people, when we're trained as doctors or other healthcare professionals, can see that suffering as a way, as an opening, as a doorway for helping people. You know, um, Leonard Cohen said, you know, the cracks are where the light comes in. You know, it's that yeah. idea. Conventional doctors giving up on me and saying, we don't know what to do with you, take prednisone, was the best thing that ever happened to me because it brought me here. So I, I'm one of those people who says, getting this sick and not figuring out how to resolve it and being forced to figure it out on my own was absolutely the best thing that ever happened to me. Well, now you don't, people don't have to do it on their own because they've got you and they've got me and other people out there doing this work. Absolutely. You shouldn't have to do it on your own. All right, next chapter, guided meditations. What's that all about? Well, meditation can be used in a number of ways. One is just repeating a sound. And um, when you meditate, you can focus your awareness. And, anytime, and you know, mental energy is really no different than any kind of energy. Einstein showed that energy and matter were interconvertible. That's what E equals MC squared is all about. And so when you focus something, you gain more power. Just like a laser is focused light, you can burn through steel or a magnifying glass, you can focus the sun's rays and you know, burn a piece of paper. And so when you focus your awareness, it has your mind has a bigger impact on your body for better and for worse oftentimes people are focused when they get angry that's one of the reasons why anger is such a powerful risk factor for heart disease and so many other conditions but if you can bring your mind to a, a more neutral or peaceful focus which is what meditation can be and there's certain sounds that people meditate on that have been found to uh, be soothing you know it's like a if you hum to your kid you know, almost intuitively they're like om or amen, or salam, or amin, or shalom, or whatever. These are words that are often translated literally to mean peace. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when we teach people to meditate in a guided meditation, it's like bring your awareness to a sound and repeat the sound. So it'd be like, om, or even the word one, you know, one, if you want something more secular. Then when you run out of air, do it again. That's all meditation is. And when your mind wanders, as it always does, everyone's does, even the, the Dalai Lama's mind wanders, just not as much as mine does, um, just bring it back over and over again. And so when you do that, your mind begins to quiet down. and You begin to experience more of that inner sense of, of peace and joy and well-being and to realize that's our natural state. And so as we talked about earlier, it's not that you have to get it, it's you just have to stop disturbing it. And then to remind yourself that you've already got that. If you take it even further, it gives you that direct experience, as I mentioned earlier, transcendence. But also something we didn't talk about, which is really important, is that we all have our own inner teacher, our inner wisdom, our inner guru, our inner whatever you want to call it. And it's that voice that speaks very softly and clearly, but it gets drowned out by the chatter of everyday life. You know, it's the voice that wakes you up in the morning and says, hey, Dean, wake up, listen up, pay attention. You're not, you need to listen to this, you know, and I go, okay. But I've learned that you can access that voice actually very directly and intentionally. So at the end of a meditation, for example, when you are feeling more peaceful, to, to ask that voice to identify itself to you, to listen to it. And what I always ask is, what am I not paying attention to that I need to? And just listen. And it's amazing what comes out of that. Oh, and, wow. because, and because it's coming from your own inner voice, you trust it. It's authentic. You don't have to like, well, maybe that's true, maybe it's not true. If you hear someone else giving you advice, it's coming from within. 
And I've learned to trust that. And when I do, it, almost invariably, it turns out to be, uh, I'm glad that I did that. How many minutes a day do you meditate? It varies. Sometimes it's an hour. You know, I get up at five and meditate because from five to six, no one's bothering me and I don't get an email. And at least I don't look at my email. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a very peaceful time of day. But sometimes I just get, you know, overwhelmed with stuff. And I, but I always meditate at least for a few minutes. I like, I, I have this old game I play with myself. It's like, okay, I don't have time to meditate for an hour. Do I have time to meditate for a minute? If I have to tell myself I don't have time to meditate for a minute, I have to admit to myself that my life is so out of balance that I'd rather just do the minute. And once you do a minute, chances are you're going to do more. It's just getting started. It's often the issue. But even a minute has real power. It's like, have you ever found yourself uh, listening to a song on the radio and then found yourself humming it later in the day? Absolutely. Consciously, your, your mind is still listening and playing it. And so when you meditate in the morning, even if it's just for a minute or two, your mind is subconsciously repeating that and it makes your fuse longer. It raises the threshold of the things that bother you so you can often do more without getting stressed and without getting sick in the process. And there's actually a lot of science behind doing meditation first thing in the morning. In fact, our, in our health boot camps, we say don't even jump out of bed. Sort of hit play because we send curated three to five minute meditations and we're like, if you don't have three minutes in the morning, because we know you're going to jump on Facebook or your social feeds and spend 20 minutes. So you can take three minutes out of that time or four minutes out of the time, press play. And there's actually science behind the fact that exactly what you're saying, where when you start your day that way with introspection, with calm, yeah. you're, you're, you've retrained yourself to stay calm the entire day. That's You'll right. have, as you said earlier, more tolerance, more patience, less reaction. And all that stuff is fabulous to get your body into the heal zone. That's right. So, yeah, all right. Well, next chapter is the chapter eight, the exercise spectrum. What yeah. is that all about? Same thing. Uh, do what you like and do it often. Uh, you know, I've learned that it's not, I, I, exercise is a perfect example of what we were talking about earlier. It's not like you have to do one kind of exercise to right. reverse or prevent heart disease, a different one for diabetes, et cetera. It's the same for all of them because exercise is also addressing each of these underlying mechanisms that we've been talking about. And so what I tell people is, I mean, there's, there's, there's aerobic exercise like walking or running. There's strength training where you, you, you resistance bands or, or lift weights. And there's flexibility exercises. So I ask people to do some of all three. But pick ones that you like. If you like it, you'll do it. It's as simple as that. And we all know that exercise is good for us. But the more studies that come out just show it's, it's even better than you might realize. I mean, you can actually grow so many new brain neurons through a process called neurogenesis after just walking for a half an hour a day for a couple months, that your brain can get measurably bigger. And particularly those parts of your brain that you want to get bigger, like the hippocampus that controls memory. You know, so often when people get older, they say like, what was that person's name and where did I leave my keys and so on? <laughs> oh, that's reversible. And, and much again, much faster. When I was in medical school, we were taught you only got a certain number of brain cells and if you went and had a couple six packs and fill off a few thousand of them, you never get them back. But you do, you know, and yeah. some of the, my favorite foods actually increase neurogenesis, you know, like tea and blueberries and chocolate and so on. But so does exercise. So with exercise, and if you can do it with a friend, you're much more likely to do it. That's why people pay trainers. It's not necessarily because of it. I mean, once you learn how to exercise, most people still have their trainers come just because it's, they're likely to do it if there's someone there with them. So if you can have a buddy and do it together, you get all the social support and you're much more likely to do it because you don't want to let down the other person than if it's just you. Uh, absolutely. All right. The next chapter is about reducing cholesterol levels using the spectrum. Chapter nine. So how can you reduce idea. lower you cholesterol? How much you want to change? What your goals are? Make that degree of change. If that's enough, great. If not, do more. It's real simple. But what's the direct link between cholesterol? Is it just all of these changes? When you make these changes, cholesterol goes down, or is there any any special, special secret? No, that's the thing. When you make these changes, everything gets better. Yeah. Your cholesterol goes down, your blood pressure goes down, your blood sugar goes down, yeah. your arteries get more flexible, you can actually reverse blockages in your arteries, your genes change, you know, you turn on the good genes, turn off the bad genes, as we talked about earlier, your telomeres get longer, you downregulate angiogenesis, which is blood vessels growing to feed tumors. You know, the more diseases we study, the more mechanisms we look at, the more improvement we show in direct proportion to the degree of change. So, if, you know, the chapters on, we can just combine them all here in one, one st statement. Yeah. Lower your cholesterol, lower, lower your weight. blood pressure. You know, it's the same thing. The more you change, the more you improve. If you don't want to make all these changes all at once, you decide how much you want to change. Do it for a month or so. M measure whatever you're tracking, whether it's your cholesterol, your blood pressure, blood sugar, whatever. If that degree of change was enough to get it down to where you want, great. If not, you can make bigger changes. And then you're in complete control and you can't fail because there's no diet to get on 
there's no diet to get off. It's just to the degree you make these changes, if you indulge yourself one day, eat healthier the next, if you don't have time to exercise one day, do more the next and so on. That's, and then it's all coming from you. And I just find that then it's much more sustainable because you can't fail and you're in complete control. Yeah, because you, you've got chapters that are sort of from nine to 14 and you talk specifically about sort of cholesterol, weight, blood pressure, type two diabetes, cardiovascular disease and prostate cancer and breast cancer. Yeah. Have you found a connection between all of these that sort of, you know, they, they are different manifestations of the same underlying issue? Exactly. That's exactly what it is. And, and each of those mechanisms is directly influenced by diet and lifestyle. So in those chapters, I review the research showing why we think these things are worth doing. Again, it comes back to, I'm a scientist first and foremost, because science is a powerful way of helping people sort out all these conflicting claims. You know, uh, it, you know, what works, what doesn't, for whom and why and under what circumstances. And so in these chapters, I review the science of saying, look, here's the science that shows how much you can improve and why it works and how you can do it. Now, part two is all about your recipes and cooking essentials. And we're gonna condense all of that into this chapter, which is Dr. Dean Ornish's meal plan. So what I wanna know, Dr. Dean, is what do you eat? So describe your day for us. What's your breakfast? What's your lunch? What's your dinner? How much wine do you drink? What's your indulgence? <laughs> well, um, uh, I'm, I don't have any chronic diseases, fortunately. I don't have high blood pressure, high cholesterol. My weight is good. You know, I don't have heart disease. In fact, I you actually have- You follow your diet. Of course you don't. Yeah, I've been doing it since I was 19. Although I, when I, I grew up in Texas eating, you know, a lot of cheeseburgers and chalupas and so on uh, three or four times a day. So it was a big change when I, when I did make the changes. I actually had a, 60, a, a 256 slice CT angiogram, non-invasive angiogram when I turned 60. And they said that I had the arteries of a 14 year old. So that made me feel wow. bad. So it does work. Um, but for me, I find that still eating the same whole foods plant-based diet is, is what I recommend. So I have, Are you a vegetarian or a vegan? I'm vegetarian. I'm not vegan, but I'm mostly I'm close, getting closer to being vegan. Um, my big indulgence is chocolate. So I try to limit the amount of that, but I, you know, good dark chocolate. And, and my wife, Anne, is a, a brilliant uh, teacher in many ways. And mm. in fact, in the Spectrum book, she did a DVD of guided meditations in the back of it. And she's the one on the cover with her arms up in the air. And oh. so she has a wonderful... Uh, in fact, we just co-wrote this new book together that'll be coming out in January called Undo It. Uh, and I talk about the science and she talks about how to. She developed a learning management system for uh, all the hospitals and clinics and physician groups that we're training around the country. Wow. So for, for breakfast, I might have, I, I really like steel cut oatmeal. Uh, and I can uh, just put that in, uh, cook that. And if I don't have time, I just microwave it in four minutes, it's ready. I put a pint of blueberries on it because I love blueberries. And there's a lot of evidence that Blueberries actually do make you smarter, which is a good thing. And a little bit of uh, low sugar um, organic soy milk on top of that. So that's my breakfast usually every day. Um, and for lunch or dinner, it just depends. You know, I'll have a, a big salad. Uh, there's living here in San Francisco, we have such access to such great produce, as you know, in the Bay Area, that you can make these incredibly beautiful salads that, that, are, that are just incredibly delicious. Um, and uh, at, at night, I'll uh, I have a steamer in my in my stove, which makes it so easy to just steam up something. And people think, oh, broccoli, that sounds gross, you know. But, you know, organic broccoli that's just lightly steamed uh, is incredibly good. You know, in fact, most of the vegetables are, as well as fruits. And so it's really easy to, for me to eat this way. And I think it's because you've had your taste buds. Uh, sort of retrained from enjoying a chalupa to enjoying the, the broccoli because yeah. that was a challenge for me you know I, I'm a sugar addict and so I was used to eating everything with gobs of sugar in it yeah. and so when I transitioned to basically a no sugar diet for 15 months like nothing I mean maybe two grapes a day was sort of the maximum sugar I was I was getting because also I was sort of almost on a no grains diet it took I would say maybe couple of weeks for my taste buds to to completely get retrained but boy you are so right when they did yes. i started finding beans sweet. i started finding broccoli sweet yeah well yeah, i mean when you train it's one of the reasons why it's sometimes actually easier to make big changes than small ones because if you were always eating some sugar but not as much your, your palate would never get a chance to change it's like people who eat less salt or go from whole milk to skim milk at first, the skim milk tastes like water. After a while, it tastes fine. After a couple of weeks, you go out to dinner and somebody gives you milk, it tastes like cream. It's too greasy, you know? Yes. Uh, but it wasn't that the cow changed, but your palate adapted. And so making big changes in some ways makes that easier. 
Um, we distinguish between sugar in, uh, that comes naturally in fruits and vegetables, for example, from added sugars, because the problem with sugar, besides the fact that you can eat so much of it without getting full, is that it gets, it's like mainlining sugars. So your blood sugar spikes, your pancreas makes insulin to bring it back down, but these repeated surges of insulin cause chronic inflammation and oxidative stress, and on the receptor level, they downregulate it, so you get what's called insulin resistance, which over time can lead to metabolic syndrome and diabetes. But when you get it in, like whole grains are very different than refined grains because whole grains are rich in fiber, which you get the, or a whole apple is different than apple juice because the fiber fills you up before you get too many calories and it slows the rate of absorption. So you don't get these spikes in blood sugar. You get kind of this nice, constant, slow elevation that it doesn't go high enough to provoke an insulin response and it goes down slowly. So you don't get these wide swings of blood sugar and that carbohydrate craving that comes from your you know, it's like putting a pendulum on one side, it goes the other, your blood sugar goes way too high, then goes way too low. So in our program, we don't eliminate carbs at all. In fact, it is mostly carbs, but they're good carbs. They're fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, soy products in their natural form, which are generally rich in fiber. And even if you eat some of the foods that are, have a higher glycemic index, most of the time people are eating them as part of a meal, and it's the overall glycemic index, how quickly your blood sugar is absorbed that really gets affected. And so I find that makes it much more sustainable. And plus, there are literally hundreds of thousands of protective substances in fruits and vegetables and whole grains and legumes, you know, phytochemicals, bioflavonoids, carotenoids, retinols, isoflavones, genosine, lycopene, on and on, that have anti-cancer, anti-heart disease, and even anti-aging properties. And the last thing I want to say about that is that I know we have a difference of opinion on this, but there's more and more evidence coming out that animal protein itself is really harmful, independent of the whole fat versus carbs thing. Uh, one study came out uh, in, in, in cell metabolism that found that people ate a lot of animal protein had a 75% higher risk of premature death from all causes and a 400 to 500% increased risk from prostate cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, diabetes, heart disease, and stroke. And, and Walter Willett and his group at Harvard, when we looked at 365,000 people in the physicians and nurses health study, found the same kinds of changes. So animal protein is inflammatory. It also causes oxidative stress. It causes, in fact, most of the mechanisms that we've been talking about are worsened by that. So again, it's not all or nothing. The spectrum is meet people where they are. To the degree they move in that direction, there's a corresponding benefit. But I think, you know, it's good to reduce your, your sugar intake, but it's also good to reduce your intake of animal protein as well. And, and uh, we find that's optimal for most people. I just wanted to refer people to our, our website, which my wife, lovely wife, uh, Anne developed. Uh, it's just ornishmyname.com. Everything on there is free. Lots of uh, recipes and science and uh, information about what we're doing. Uh, so again, I hope that, again, it's all about raising awareness and giving people the support they need. Dr. Ornish, thank you so much for this incredible insights, for your amazing books. You have a new book coming up and we are going to be doing an interview. So for those of you, you know, stay tuned. We're definitely gonna be doing an interview that's focused on Dr. Ornish's new book that's going to come out. But give us a little teaser. What's the book about? What's the big aha? Uh -huh. uh, well, the book is called Undo It. Uh, and uh, it's a riff on Just Do It, of course, but also my teacher who said, what are you, a Hindu? And she said, no, I'm a, an undo. <laughs> um, but it's, the, it's, it's basically the idea that we've been talking about here, that, the same, that with all this interest in personalization, it's the same lifestyle changes that can prevent and reverse all of these major chronic diseases and why and uh, what ties it all together. It'll be coming out in January of next year. Really looking forward to it. Thank you so much for the rest of you. Uh, make those changes. They're not that hard to make. They just seem like they're hard to make. So check out Health Boot Camps. Please check out Dr. Ornish's site. We're going to put a lot of links, a lot of stuff that's free as well. So make sure you check out the show notes and check out Dr. Dean Ornish's diet. Thank you so much. Oh, great pleasure. Thank you for raising so much awareness in the world.